Uh, good evening, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to this new webinar of the Law School of Euclid Cyprus. Uh, but this time we are very happy that we are a partnership with uh, one of our EU funded projects, which is EU Enforce, uh, which is actually um, um, coordinated by the University of Maribor. So let me tell you a few more things about this. Um, First of all, on behalf of the school and on behalf of the UN Force project, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all this evening to this expert webinar, whose purpose is to present some of the findings of the EU Enforce project on the diversity of enforcement titles in cross-border debt collection in the EU, in the European and Cypriot context. And you will understand why, when uh, our speakers start uh, their presentations, why the separate context is important, as well as, of course, the European overview. I would like to thank our colleagues from the University of Maribor for their support in the organization of this webinar, including our guest speakers tonight. So, Professor Dr. Vesna Rijavec and Mr. Denis Pagriza Behi for their willingness to speak to us and their time with us tonight. We really appreciate and uh, we haven't seen each other face to face for two years. So we really appreciate, you know, the time and the efforts and the good cooperation we've enjoyed across all throughout the project. I would also like to thank our colleague, our peer, uh, Dr. Nicolas Kiriakidis, who is an advocate, as uh, many of you know, but he's also a colleague at the, at the University of Nicosia and um, for his invaluable input on the topic of tonight, which is close to his heart, as, as I know. As well as our colleagues at the School of Law um, of Euclid Cyprus, Dr. Nevia Gabiu and Dr. Dimitra Loizu. Not only are they great colleagues at the school, but they are also experts, very good experts on the EU-funded EU Enforced Projects. So I'd like to thank them for their constant assistance on the project and its dissemination in Cyprus to students, academics, lawyers and judges across frontiers. Um, our main speakers' bios appear on the program of tonight's event. You can find the program in this Microsoft Teams uh, classroom under files. So I hope you will allow me to refer uh, the audience to the bios rather than enumerate the extensive achievements of our guest speakers because that will take too long. And finally, I would like to thank all other colleagues who assisted in the preparations for tonight's event as well as all of uh, you attending tonight and spending you know, this time uh, with us rather than with family or, or any, any other business. So, as evidenced by, uh, as an evidence of our commitment to open education, it's a pleasure and honor to be able to engage with the large variety of participants in this webinar, including students, academics, professionals from the public and the private sector, as well as the wider public from Cyprus and Europe. I'm particularly happy to see colleagues from other member states and also alumni of the school. So welcome to everyone. Before I give the floor to my esteemed colleagues, I would like to remind, remind everyone that this webinar is recorded for the purposes of widening access to educational resources and that you have been asked to consent to this, to the recording. So I would please ask all of you who are not speakers to keep your cameras and Microsoft microphones off and to use the chat function in the MS Teams classroom to ask questions or make comments. If you do not wish to appear at all on the recordings, then do not use the chat function either. Um, can I please also remind you that uh, speakers and uh, participants tonight will take part uh, to this webinar for educational purposes in an educational setting that means that whatever each participant uh, will provide verbally, electronically or otherwise uh, must not be accepted or interpreted as either legal advice or any form of advice. You may view materials at your disposal in the MS Teams classroom, uh, which you are free to take away from this webinar. 
and use with the necessary acknowledgements. Subject to the professional background of each attendee, participation may contribute to your formal or informal continuing to continuous professional development or CPD, personal development, PD, or other self-managed learning and development needs. Cyprus registered lawyers have been asked to provide their registration number so that we may report their CPD hours for this webinar onto the CBA platform. It is necessary, however, to attend the whole event. Uh, so that's very important for you to know that in order to collect the hours. But let me say just a few words about the EU Enforced Projects uh, coordinated by the Faculty of Law of the University of Maribor in Slovenia, on which we at the School of Law of Cyprus are pr proud partners. The project deals across the EU and beyond with the increasing need for cross-border enforcement of claims on the grounds of enforcement titles in Europe. It identifies and tackles one of the main obstacles in cross-border enforcement of titles, that is the lack of mutual trust between national authorities of different EU member states, as the national authorities treat enforcement titles from other member states with some reservations and mistrusts. This is further, further enhanced by the diversity in the form uh, of enforcement titles across legal systems and areas of the law. So this is why a large number of partner institutions across multiple European countries contribute through this project to a better understanding of differences in structure, content and effects of judgments in individual member states. The Project examines through various methodologies and tools the impact of these differences on cross-border enforcement of titles and proposes solutions to achieve a higher level of mutual trust and understanding among legal systems and professionals in the framework of recognition and enforcement of titles in Europe. The project also examines the importance of uh, terminological barriers that occur during the course of cross-border enforcement and the possibilities for overcoming obstacles to cross-border enforcement resulting from technology and progress of technology. The role of Cyprus in this project is very valuable uh, as being the main common law jurisdiction represented among the partners and uh, legal systems. So it is therefore before all, an exercise of mutual learning and exchange of best practice to the benefit of the legal profession as a whole. Thus, we are proud to organize for the second time inside, well, a Cyprus-based dissemination event for the project, although this time online. Our colleagues will remember their visit to the island of Cyprus two years ago, just before the first lockdowns across Europe where civil lawyers, notaries and academics had the opportunity to exchange with Cypriot representatives of the judiciary and the legal profession at the Supreme Court of Cyprus and at the Levendis Art Gallery, where common law met civil law traditions of recognition and enforcement of titles. So at the close of this project, we're very happy to be able to have again our colleagues with us and to give them the floor to give us their own perspectives of uh, a European and national dimension. Now, I'm afraid that I will have to leave you at some point in the webinar. I apologize for this, but you are in very good company, so I'm not, uh, I'm not worried at all. Now, our first speaker is uh, our uh, colleague from uh, Maribor, Slovenia, uh, Professor Dr. Vesna Jeravec, Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Maribor, Slovenia. It's a real pleasure to have you again, Vesna, with us. You've got about uh, half an hour, from what I can see from the programme, to, well, uh, present to us uh, whatever aspects of lease pendants and related actions in cross-border proceedings you would like. We are all ears. Thank you very much. So let me uh, express my warm thanks to uh, you, Stephanie, 
and to uh, your team. Uh, so this cooperation really worked so very well and uh, we can really share very good memories on uh, our uh, meetings uh, in Cyprus. So it uh, is a very fruitful cooperation in, within this project and I hope that uh, we will continue this further even we establish another links so you were uh, uh, a lecturer uh, uh, you, your contribution was very valuable last year for the uh, big conference uh, we organized medicine uh, law and society and uh, I, I'm very glad so that with your help and assistance that we added also this part of uh, common law experience so that uh, uh, I must uh, tell that uh, this is uh, now the last month of uh, uh, this current project. Uh, we are all very worried uh, to finish it uh, in uh, with all the tasks, what we promised to the Commission, but uh, uh, I'm sure so that this will be a, a great work. Uh, all together and uh, what I probably need uh, to share with you also that uh, the um, main deliverable, the main result of this project uh, uh, is actually the monograph with many chapters regarding all these different issues that uh, we researched in these uh, two years. And so uh, I think that uh, we will uh, publish it at Kluver and uh, again so that we will uh, be then uh, accessible to everyone who will be probably interested afterwards uh, what uh, uh, we put together all these efforts of different uh, member states and uh, different partners. So it's 16 member states and uh, 12 uh, uh, different partners. So I'm very proud that uh, we really managed uh, uh, to make this uh, wonderful group. Uh, and uh, uh, Navy showed us before the picture. And uh, let me now start with my, uh, as you said, modded uh, uh, issues. So uh, regarding uh, list pendants rules and uh, uh, the related actions. Do you see my presentation? Yes, Vesna, we can see. Thank you. OK, so uh, uh, let's start with uh, just uh, basic knowledge on pendency rules regarding Brussels 1A regulation. Sometimes I use Brussels 1A because we decided in the project uh, for this uh, a, a, a short uh, identification, but uh, it's actually sometimes Brussels 1 recast. Uh, however, uh, let me share with you this information that the Brussels 1A is getting a, a, a new recast uh, uh, in uh, uh, near future and uh, I'm trying to participate uh, uh, to this uh, um, uh, efforts uh, as well with uh, some ideas that we collected all together in this project. But uh, pendency rules are really a difficult, uh, difficult problem uh, to uh, everyone uh, who deals with mostly commercial disputes because uh, there is always uh, a, a threat that uh, the torpedo action uh, is submitted in another country and uh, uh, causing a lot of delays. But however, uh, so uh, the Brussels 1A stipulated uh, under traditional civil law solution, if another court is already seized of a matter, the second court seized must decline jurisdiction. Assessment of identity, but is a very difficult issue, but not just for lease pendants, but also for modification of claim and later in uh, recognizing two different two, uh, uh, two judgment that can be uh, uh, one of them res judicata to the other. The identity of subject matter uh, in German, objektive identität des Anspruchs, this is really a, a very difficult issue in all procedural theories. However, so uh, I just give you a list 
that even the Brussels 1A uh, deals with so many different terms. Terminology is difficult as well. So that we can, it was not possible to unify uh, all the terms so that we have same cause of action uh, and wegen the silben Anspruchs, it is the same claim. O istem zahtevku, it's Slovenian, uh, it's German, Austrian, very similar. Sama sak, uh, the same claim in Swedish, and le même objet et la même cause, uh, it's uh, this uh, double, uh, uh, double definition uh, uh, that is uh, also uh, adopted as the same outline for interpretation by the uh, ECJ, uh, ECJ. So let me start with the Gubish case. Uh, it's an action for the performance of sales contract whereby the seller sought payment of the price from the buyer. An action for a negative declaration whereby the buyer sought a declaration holding either that the contract was null and void or that the seller had committed a fundamental breach of the contract discharging buyer from his obligations very common situation but the ecj held that because the execution of the same contract was at the heart of the two actions. And this is famous Kernpunkt theory. So these two actions need to be uh, dealt together because they are having the same object and the same title. Even though pursuant the domestic legal conceptions of the relevant member states, the identity of the object of the two actions apparently could not be affirmed, could be uh, uh, assumed different. But uh, it's also about introducing a defense and this connection is every time very, uh, very much uh, uh, stressed in all these different uh, ECJ judgments, cases. So let's uh, uh, name only a few of them. And there is a Tatri case uh, that stated that the cause of action comprises the facts and the rule of law relied on as the basis of the action Comparing with the procedural equivalence theory, this is common in Germany, in Slovenia, in Croatia, so that we have uh, to check both. Uh, uh, one is the request for a re relief and then the facts and the title all together to, to get uh, uh, the result if two claims are identical. And uh, uh, ECJ also find, found same end in view to prevent conflicting judgments. There is uh, uh, what I need to say about Cyprus and you can probably then upgrade me uh, that Cyprus also uh, has a cause of action uh, as a part of internal uh, legislation and uh, includes the total of facts that found the right to bring a claim. But in contractual claims, this does not necessarily mean the whole cause of action. The courts of Cyprus adopted the EU law concept of a cause of action. So here is uh, uh, no uh, difference, but uh, not everywhere uh, the same. So uh, to uh, proceed with identity of parties, uh, this is not very problematic issues because 
uh, there are uh, some. It, there is some case law that uh, uh, interpreted uh, this notion very well. However, so uh, we can uh, also see that uh, the situation can be reversed. So once claimant uh, uh, in other. Uh, uh, action in other lawsuit, the defendant doesn't matter uh, if the parties are, are still uh, from the same circle. But sometimes uh, the parties are different and this is not uh, then the, uh, uh, the situation for um, litis pendants, litis pendants, but for probably related, related uh, actions. But let's go uh, uh, first to uh, the main problem of pendency rules. Actually, this is negative declaratory action. And uh, also the Tatri case, the very old case, uh, found that there is uh, an identity between positive uh, claim action for performance. I call it condemnatory action. And uh, then on the other hand, negative declaratory uh, uh, action uh, and uh, however so this identity that was uh, that was um, um, judged in uh, many cases uh, afterwards too but this change perception in many places actually before the approach of national procedural law in Germany and Austria used to be that a negative declaratory claim could not prevent a subsequent positive condemnatory action because the condemnatory action, this is the action for performance, is in essence a more comprehensive legal protection and we see it's different. We have just one part, uh, uh, the grounds uh, of liability and uh, if we have this for performance, we have the amount of money if uh, uh, the talk is of pecuniary uh, uh, claims. But uh, uh, however, so mutually exclusive claims are at the EU level recognized as uh, uh, the uh, least spending situation and the obstacle for the new uh, later uh, uh, claim. And uh, just uh, to remind you that Tatris facts are reversed from those in Gubish. Gubish uh, was first condemnatory uh, action and uh, uh, then a second was a negative declaratory action that the contract is null and void. But here uh, first it was uh, uh, submitted uh, the negative declaratory action and uh, so it is uh, really a problem how that uh, we can uh, uh, evaluate uh, Italian torpedoes of the situation. And uh, so just to go back to 1997, that Milan's Franzosi, uh, who uh, gave uh, the uh, name to uh, this situation because of the very slow Italian courts. And uh, so that this is the speculation of some claimants who wants to prevent a uh, quick uh, adjudication of their dispute just to go to another member state uh, and uh, start a uh, uh, dispute, start uh, a lawsuit just uh, uh, to prevent uh, quick uh, uh, issues in other member states. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, this is possible because the jurisdiction rules uh, give uh, optional jurisdiction criteria that they can establish uh, also. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, the claim uh, jurisdiction for the torts. So uh, it's uh, there. There are many optional optional uh, jurisdiction also where uh, uh, in torts uh, the damage occurred, and so we can see that it is not just. Uh, 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 just uh, uh, occupation or seizure of the um, e jurisdiction that is uh, not under the Brussels uh, 1A, but uh, is correct. What is wrong is actually so that 
uh, the uh, sum of uh, uh, that one part is gaining uh, gaining some benefits, some uh, unjustified benefits out of the situation. And so uh, let me explain today to you a uh, 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 very famous uh, Slovenian case uh, that hasn't reached uh, uh, Luxembourg court uh, yet, but I think that uh, this story uh, will end uh, uh, somehow there, although uh, so it's uh, uh, probably also the uh, ground uh, to find new solutions in Brussels 1A in, in this next recast, because uh, uh, there are too many, too uh, many uh, really uh, uh, damaged uh, damages uh, causing by uh, such uh, uh, an open uh, uh, possibility to uh, submit lawsuits uh, uh, just for the reason uh, to be quicker than uh, another party but uh, so just go back uh, austria neighbors with italy but however so uh, it is uh, uh, the uh, system that it's well known to Slovenia and vice versa, so th that we both share the same civil procedure history. Franz Klein is uh, the famous author who drafted uh, so many years ago the first CPO. And uh, but however, uh, th th it happened uh, very heavy rainfall in 2012. You see how long this case is open, and 2012. So many other uh, uh, disasters happened afterwards, but it's still open. So you see what happened because of this uh, running for the forum. Am I too loud? Okay, so Drava is the river uh, uh, that has uh, uh, mm, very long trace from Austria, uh, uh, then uh, 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 over the whole Slovenia. And uh, so the, this heavy rainfall uh, in Carinthia uh, caused uh, excess, uh, uh, caused floods on the Drava uh, river banks in Slovenia in Styria and what is uh, actually uh, the accusation that the uh, hydroelectric power plant uh, in uh, Austria did not dealt did, did not uh, uh, deal with excessive waters in appropriate man manner and then many lawsuits were filled in in Slovenia but one in uh, uh, Austria, that is ne negative declaratory action. And uh, so uh, uh, Slovenian, Slovenian court in Maribor upon defendant's objection in one case, this is insurance company versus power plant, suspended the proceedings because proceedings were pending before the Austrian court between the same litigants in which the defendant claims that he did not have liability for the flood events in November. But uh, this action was really very, very drafted. It, it's not complete. It's just uh, uh, affirming that uh, there is no liability for the flood event. And uh, the Austrian court actually first denied its jurisdiction due to the deficiency concerning submission of the action. If this decision became final, the obstacle to lease pendants would disappear extinct and the Slovenian court would no longer be obstructed to proceed. However, in the second and third Austrian instances, the opposite decision, decision was reached that accepted Austrian jurisdiction. And this is final decision now. It's binding, it's final as res judicata. Slovenian court continued the state procedure and issues after getting knowledge of the acceptance of jurisdiction. A decision that denied Slovenian jurisdiction 
but be be uh, attentive, but did not dismiss the action. Uh, one uh, more uh, point needs to be addressed, legal interest for declaratory action. I think that this is probably not for common law, but continental systems, they know uh, 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 demand uh, to uh, to uh, prove the uh, legal interest if you want to sue uh, as a declaratory uh, claim. But uh, so uh, uh, what is here a possibility uh, to uh, find special legal interest in negative declaratory action? This could be the specific uniform uh, provision for Brussels 1A that can help to prevent from torpedo actions. But this is only, you know, just uh, uh, one of uh, uh, my ideas. So it's it's not proven, but however, I will express it for the commission in our results uh, uh, after we finish the final report. Uh, and uh, there another, what is the problem here with uh, uh, this action? that uh, uh, I uh, paid your attention that it's very, very rough. It's no, not many uh, inform, not uh, many data in it, just claiming that there is no liability for flood event. On the other hand, this uh, second positive uh, condemnatory action is full of data that can then give an uh, outline uh, for the court to adjudicate the case uh, and uh, uh, for performance uh, of the certain uh, amount uh, of money. Uh, so the problem I see is the, you cannot start negative uh, declaratory action just on abstract hypothetical case. You need to, to pay more attention to a, a draft such uh, such an action, but uh, uh, of course, uh, so uh, uh, the case law was not uh, was really uh, giving uh, uh, different uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, the action. Uh, so, what shall the plaintiff fulfill to achieve the effect of lease pendants? Of course, uh, to acquire lease pendants, uh, it's according to Brussels 1A, necessary so that the, the action is lodged at the court, but not served to the defendant, because this is, uh, however, the, to uh, breach these differences between different legal systems, uh, what is the moment of start of lease pendants? And uh, so this is enough uh, that it just uh, is uh, uh, the action uh, or another document to start uh, the lawsuit is lodged uh, at the court. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the regulation also gives the task uh, to uh, the claimant uh, to, um, or to support service that this service is affected on the defendant. And what are the tasks that need to be the fulfilled? What was the problem with this uh, flood uh, uh, event, with this flood case? That uh, there was just uh, uh, submitted an action without translation, although it was, uh, the claimant was aware that the, the translation is needed, but they wanted to be first. So they accelerated everything and they just uh, submitted without uh, a translation. But however, so this was dealt uh, by many instances in Austria and was established that uh, this is not a problem because the Austrian court later provided uh, the defendant uh, with uh, translation into Slovenian language. Uh, however, just uh, a remark, the translations are still 
uh, a very opaque issue in uh, cross-border uh, cooperation. So, but uh, let's go further. Mm, what procedural act constitutes a determination of jurisdiction? This is uh, also a, a problem. So, is it necessary to issue a, a decree, a, a decision, or it's just uh, so that uh, uh, is accepted also by another party, or just uh, that the a court proceeds with um, hearings? And uh, but, however, more or less. Uh, in practice, uh, the courts always issue a decree, and this decree is also subject to legal remedies, and this makes uh, also the uh, postponement or the delays, causes the uh, 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 delays. And uh, now the question, a uh, very specific procedural question, is conduct of the second court getting knowledge of prior proceedings. I mentioned before that Slovenian court uh, was uh, informed by one of the parties that uh, the decision in Austria became final uh, regarding jurisdiction and so, uh, but uh, they uh, need to accept uh, this, uh, even it, they need to accept uh, the information on the uh, first seized court without uh, uh, any objection, even if it was erroneous. But, however, the two courts might not have the same opinion on the identity of claims and priority of actions. Uh, so here <clears throat> you need uh, uh, to uh, follow this difficult example. So the, the Slovenian court was not uh, uh, always, in all these cases, the same opinion what is actually uh, the identity of subject matter and what uh, to do if it's just uh, related actions. So it's, but on the other hand, uh, it needs to be interpreted uh, Euro autonomously in an autonom autonomous way. So uh, action for performance, this my condemnatory action represents more comprehensive protection than declaratory one. Actually, this is the case in Germany, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia. But uh, so what uh, uh, to do? First of all, in cross-border cases, lease pendants is undebatable. Uh, it's no debate. It's just certainly lease pendants. But in uh, domestic cases, is it possible to go now uh, Slovenian uh, Slovenian party insurance company to submit uh, a lawsuit in Austria uh, as a separate uh, a new lawsuit or uh, to go just and uh, submit a counterclaim in the same procedure uh, as the ne negative declaratory action is pending. Go, go, go. Counterclaim. So I need to uh, address a few words to counterclaim. And counterclaim is connected claim uh, to the main uh, dispute. But on the other hand, it's uh, a allied. It's not the same uh, claim. It's not part of the claim, but is uh, uh, the claim that can be also adjudicated even if the main claim is dismissed. So it's not just the defense, so it's something else. But if uh, you see that uh, a Slovenian uh, party submits this counterclaim in Austria, is it allied? or is the same because it was established the same for cross-border issues, but not for the national issues. 
this is also mm, I see to be solved somehow in the future. And uh, on the other hand, why uh, uh, to do to 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 go and uh, to submit another uh, uh, claim that was now state or I don't know what happened uh, with the claim uh, with the action in Slovenia because it was not rejected. It was just a uh, 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 declined jurisdiction, but this can then be uh, this uh, action can revive later if the negative declaratory action in Austria, for example, would uh, be denied, would be refused by the Austrian court. But let's see. But uh, somehow statute of limitation is the problem because uh, uh, if uh, there is a rejection uh, uh, of a claim, so uh, in three months uh, by uh, substantive law in Slovenia, another uh, action can be filed uh, in to interrupt this uh, uh, statute of limitation period. However, uh, so uh, I see no need to do uh, this just for the reason uh, of uh, statute of limitations, because interruption of the statute of limitation period happens uh, also if the defendant in the negative declaratory claim uh, addresses his objections uh, uh, against the claim and uh, under Slovenian law, I see substantive law. I see this as a reason to interrupt the statute statute of limitation uh, period. But probably this is too specific, too detailed for uh, uh, this forum today. So I, I get uh, to my final uh, part. And uh, uh, actually, this is uh, uh, a risk of forum shopping and forum running. And uh, there is no doubt uh, that uh, uh, lease pendants rules still encourage tactics uh, designed to delay the lawsuit from proceeding in the forum prescribed by the regulation. The improvement with the rule in Brussels 1a that the jurisdiction expressly agreed by parties has exclusive nature only solved a small part of the problem. And uh, so I see the open podium for next discussions and this is also started not just uh, in uh, this main regulation Brussels 1a but also in for insolvency regulation that uh, torpedo actions, the torpedo cases, uh, uh, these uh, uh, proceedings are, are also very annoying and uh, uh, against the uh, security, uh, uh, against the access to justice. A prorogation clauses, as I mentioned, so uh, the uh, torpedo lawsuit is only possible if elective jurisdiction is given. This is the improvement. Ex excluded is also in consumer matters and in matters of exclusive jurisdiction. Sh short term rent is not such a matter, for example, and restricted to individual labor disputes. However, so let's go to the idea of prohibition of the abuse of rights in general, because uh, everywhere even we have uh, uh, this convention on uh, human rights, European Convention on Human Rights, but we have now a charter, a treaty of uh, uh, European Union uh, uh, on human rights, so we need to uh, uh, be careful. We need uh, to pay attention. Also, the national courts need to pay attention uh, to prevent abuse of rights. And but how to 
assess some action activities as abuse of rights. Is it uh, the activity that uh, plaintiff creates for himself the position of the domestic party? Some of the party's motives should be per se inadmissible. For example, the motive of achieve, uh, achieving success that could not be expected in another country, achieving the highest possible compensation, silencing critical public voices, and preventing public interest debate. So we have not, not uh, we have no definite answers to this, but Drava flood case, is it forum running or torpedo? Is it something that is against law? And of course, this also initiated a dispute on the illegitimate seizure of jurisdiction. And of course, Austrian court was very, very ignorant to the question. Of course, because it was, I don't know how, uh, 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 just uh, they uh, relied to the uh, previous cases of the ECJ. And uh, so, but I, th I see this is an open issue to need, need to be addressed in general. And of course, it is, we have the previous case, Gasser, and it was uh, uh, the claimant who uh, had fear from English common law system. So this was then in the case acknowledged that, of course, uh, such uh, uh, forum running has the sense is not illegitimate. On the other hand, so this neighbor country, Slovenia and Austria, we have a lot uh, of uh, uh, experience and mm, I see that this should be considered an, a legitimate goal to gain the advantage, the maneuver of negative declaratory actions unreasonably delays resolving case. So you see from 2012, the plaintiff hopes that the long delay together with the potential costs and inconvenience of taking part in court proceedings abroad will make the other party give up his claim or accept a settlement favorable to the former. But on the other hand, uh, this is immoral uh, uh, negative declaratory action because they started negotiations and uh, uh, to prevent these costly procedures, negotiations could really uh, made uh, 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 the best result. But however, so this was not possible because of uh, the forum running or torpedo. I will uh, just uh, skip collective redress, but uh, it's one of the issues that needs to be also ad ad addressed regarding lease pendency rules. And uh, on the other, uh, uh, just the, the last uh, uh, issue is related actions. Some of the cases with not the same parties because the parties are uh, very different claimants in Slovenia, and uh, so this could be m suspended because the uh, for not the same parties, not just the same claim, uh, the Brussels 1A also tries to prevent uh, colliding, conflicting judgments uh, uh, on the same uh, issues. And th this is why the court the second court may suspend uh, it under the following conditions. If it has jurisdiction to decide in the proceedings in question, if the proceedings before the first court are still pending, if the claims are related, if the national law of the first court allows for the joinder of litigation somehow, uh, in continental law, the joinder of litigation is very common uh, from economic uh, reasons. 
Uh, on the other hand, so we don't really have a lot of experience with related actions, neither in the uh, jurisprudence uh, uh, and uh, in the case law of uh, of uh, ECJ. Let me conclude uh, with the um, with uh, the finding that least pendants still much too negatively influence access to justice. Even if the courts of the court first seized are not particularly slow, parallel proceedings every time cause delays, you see from 2012, not possible to omit. It was not possible to, to accelerate anything. In principle, the first stage waiting for the acceptance of jurisdiction in principle requires decisions in more instances in both countries because the other country is probably not the same opinion uh, about the identity of claims. Every time the lease pendants rule obliged the court second cease to stay proceedings until the court first cease makes up its mind about its jurisdiction. So most promising to the problem posed by the abusive use of negative declaration actions may be careful control of admissi admissibility of those actions performed directly by the judge seized. This is very difficult task. To set the time limit to finalize the decision on jurisdiction in transnational litigations now left to the national rules of procedure. Probably we can uh, uh, also find some other further ideas to improve this, but uh, let me thank you for your attention for today. And of course, I'm very much ready and will be very much happy uh, uh, to uh, answer some more questions and I will participate at the round table so that this discussion can go further. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Besna, for sharing with us your your very detailed and, and, and technical knowledge of uh, that area of the law. Thank you so much for sharing with us, you know, uh, real examples and, and, and analyzing uh, case of the court. Uh, without any further ado, I will ask Dennis because we are a little bit behind schedule. So uh, if Dennis, you don't want to use the whole of the 30 minutes, then <laughs> this is very fine with us. Uh, Vesna, would you mind unsharing your screen so that Dennis can share his? Well, uh, I'd also like to start off by saying that um, I'm very thankful to the organizers, uh, first of all, for coming up with this event. It's a great opportunity to uh, disseminate and discuss uh, on the project topics. And secondly, of course, for having me. I'm very thankful. Now, uh, my presentation, uh, I'll stick to the half an hour or less, uh, will be uh, presented in two parts. The first one will be uh, more or less focused on presenting uh, some of the uh, deliverables and activities of the project. And the second one uh, will be more of a substance. Um, I will address the issue of res judicata uh, um, in uh, the uh, Brussels regime. Now, uh, the UN Force project, as previously stated, we have a large consortium of 16 partner institutions from 13 member states. Uh, this allows us to gather much info from a diverse set of member states, including one candidate state, that is Albania. Uh, so we can conduct a comparison uh, from uh, both major legal systems, such as that of French and uh, Spain, uh, and from minor legal systems, such as Slovenia, Croatia, and so on. Uh, I think that the results will thus be uh, quite useful for further research and I believe that further research into these concepts, concepts will be necessary if we are ever to uh, strive to unify the European civil procedure. Now, uh, as mentioned by Professor Stephanie previously, um, the goal of this project is to address the diversity, but what diversity? So we're looking at 
three main elements, structure, contents, and effects of enforcement titles. And we've chosen three enforcement titles, judgment, uh, notarial deeds, and judicial settlements, with a great emphasis on judgments. Uh, how have we conducted our research? Well, uh, the main methodological approach was through a through a questionnaire. So each partner received a questionnaire for which it then completed uh, a national report. Uh, these reports are mainly published already on the project website. Apart from certain reports, which will be issued in book form, including the Slovenian and Cypriot one. Uh, we've conducted several questionnaires. One a very uh, large one on substance and effects and one smaller one on structure and one minuscule one on the interest. So the interest pertaining to judgments. Um, I should say that the amalgamation of these national reports amounts to well over a thousand and five hundred pages. So whoever wishes to indulge into them is very welcome and uh, but should take time to uh, to study them. Uh, we've also um, envisaged several several ancillary deliverables, um, such as the glossary. Now, this glossary is not of a linguistic nature. It's still not yet published, but we've already uh, completed it. By using data from national reports, um, this glossary will provide practitioners uh, an overview of the decisions each member state court can issue and whether or not these decisions are capable of being considered judgments in the sense of the Brussels one regulation because we know that the Brussels one regulation adheres to judgments and these judgments have to be euro autonomously interpreted so not each court decisions uh, can be considered as judgments further on we've also um, uh, from the data we've uh, gathered from the national reports, uh, constructed uh, enforcement manuals, not yet published, but they're already completed. These will provide protected practitioners, mainly those involved in cross-border enforcement, uh, the opportunity to quickly acquaint themselves with a foreign enforcement title. So, for instance, if I, as a Slovenian judge, for instance, will be, um, uh, will get a Cypriot judgment, uh, I will have this manual in front of me, which will allow me to quickly identify, for instance, the headline, uh, the operative part, the effects of the operative part, and so on. So this, this is just very basic instructions for uh, the practitioners to get to know the foreign enforcement title quickly. This is done for judgments, for material deeds, and for settlements. Uh, we've also written several scientific and expert articles. Uh, the one you have uh, is from your very own Demetra and Despina. They've uh, discussed the concept of res judicata in common law systems. Uh, well, today I'll be focusing on the continental, on the civil law, so perhaps that's going to be interesting for you as much as it was interesting for us to read about the common law concept. Uh, we've uh, gathered more than 20 articles, and uh, if anyone listening today is also interested, the Lexonomica Journal is a journal of the University of Maribor, uh, so you're welcome to take a look at it and perhaps submit something for, uh, uh, for uh, publication. We've conducted several activities. Um, this picture was, I believe, already shown today from UCLan. You'll probably all recognize this. The above picture is from our kickoff meeting in Maribor. And we've also uh, conducted two uh, conferences. Uh, we had the fortunate luck of uh, getting to conduct a conference this uh, summer in September uh, where in, we could hold it physically. And one final expert meeting remains to be conducted in Albania. If everything goes according to plan, this will be on the 4th and 5th March. So just one month away. Further information on the project is available on the project website. I also known that UCLan has a separate website for the project and UCLan also has a separate Facebook account for the project, but we also have a main Facebook and Twitter account as well as a blog. So also anyone interested in blog posting about civil procedure and cross-border enforcement is welcome to perhaps uh, submit something. Uh, and we also have flyers and brochures with further info. 
Now the last piece of info on the project are the IT deliverables. So uh, this is a still a work in progress and I dearly hope the mm, IT partner will be able to uh, submit a prototype by the end of the project. Uh, basically, we want to allow practitioners to go online to check separate enforcement titles from many different states and to interactively uh, click on them uh, and gather information. So, for instance, you would click on an operative part and gain, okay, this is res judicata effect, uh, the parties are identified here, uh, this is what the operative part communicates in regards to the claim, and so on. Uh, so we hope that this will prove to be a good prototype and that in the future the European Judicial Atlas or something similar can incorporate an application like this. Now, uh, going on to the substantive portion of my presentation, I'll be dealing with the res judicata effect in the free movement of judgments. What I mean with this is how does the res judicata effect from member state A translate to member state B, because we all know that in the European Union, the theory of extension of effects applies, but uh, with the Gother judgment, the more recent judgment, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union has basically introduced a two-tier system of recognizing these res judicata effects. But more on that a bit later. Now, uh, regarding judgments and their effects, I'm sure you're all very well acquainted with this, we'll be focusing on the procedural uh, effects of res judicata. The, some of the member states, however, have stated that res judicata effects in their legal system are more pertaining to substantive law. So that's an interesting notion to be made. In, the con in continental law, res judicata is subject to many distinctions. So first of all, we have formal and material vis-a-vis -vis substantive res judicata. The former is the a precondition for the latter, formal of course meaning that a judgment cannot be attacked with ordinary means, and the latter, the material res judicata, meaning that a judgment has binding and preclusive effects. It holds an in inherent truth, which the parties and the courts must respect. The majority of continental member states then distinct positive and negative res judicata. These can roughly be approximated to be binding effects, meaning that parties in subsequent proceedings are bound by the findings, be it legal or factual, of the prior judgment, and preclusive effects, which prevent the relitigation of claims, facts, and legal observations of a court. Now, this is, of course, all very important because there are drastic differences between the scope of res judicata from one member state to another. Some member states uh, extend res judicata not only to the operative part, but also to the reasoning, to factual and legal grounds. Others restrict it to the operative part. Uh, because of the theory of extension of effects, a judgment rendered in member state A should have the same effects in member state B. So the same extended effects, this means that the same binding and precluding effects carry over to the member states of enforcement, so to speak. So another, a party cannot initiate relitigation in member state B. Within the same scope, it cannot re initiate relitigation within the member state of origin. Uh, for instance, if I were to go to Cyprus, this Cypriot judge would have to look to the Slovenian scope of res judicata to determine whether I could reinitiate litigation in respect to a judgment which has already been rendered. Now, later, the Gother judgment uh, introduced a Euro autonomous understanding of res judicata, somewhat der derogating the theory of extension of effects, but we'll deal with Gother a bit later. Within the project, as I mentioned, we had uh, 13 member states represented, but we conducted an analysis with national reports from 18 uh, states, so 17 member states and one state candidate. Of course, it's very hard 
to analyze uh, the effects of res judicata for each of the member states uh, separately. So it comes in handy if we group them up. Uh, so into uh, we've done this for three distinct groups, uh, the French, German and Italian model. So these, um, these are considered representative of minor jurisdictions as well. Uh, but of course, many nuances exist between the models themselves. For instance, the German model encapsulates those countries with the German legal tradition, for instance, Austria, Slovenia and Croatia. We all share the same conception of res judicata and its scopes. However, there are very, um, uh, there are uh, many uh, minute differences uh, which have to be taken into account if, you know, a real case would arise. Now, in Germany, how one determines uh, res judicata is through the so-called Zweigliedrige theory, so the two-part theory. It's also used, as Professor Riev has previously mentioned, to determine the subject matter in list pendants. Now, how would one uh, uh, then determine the scope of res judicata, of what has been adjudicated. Well, one would look to the relief sought by the party and the circumstances from which claimant derives his rights, the Lebensachverhalt. But this means not just any circumstances or all of the circumstances that the claimant has put forth, but a historic event, a life event. So the, these are contained events. They have to be somewhat logically or historically connected with one another. Going to the part of judgment, which becomes res judicata, it's under the German model, only the operative part, which becomes res judicata. And the operative part only, the tenor only, communicates what the defendant ought to do. So, for instance, A is liable to pay the amount of 200 euros. If res judicata is restricted only to the operative part, this means that only the claim for 200 euros is precluded. Not the factual findings, the legal qualifications and determinations on preliminary legal questions. Only the material claim. Now, Preliminary legal questions, I mean prejudicial issues, for instance, if I'm suing someone to uh, hand over property, I first have to, of course, uh, demonstrate that I am the legal owner of that property. This is a prejudicial question. Now, uh, these can also become uh, res judicata, but only with a zwischensfeststellungsklage. This means that uh, the party has to uh, produce an interim relief sought. So uh, it doesn't become res judicata on its own, because if a party then uh, produces another interim relief, this interim relief will enter the operative part. Uh, because the relief sought is basically what the court, if it finds the claim founded, will copy and paste into the operative part of the judgment. Now, uh, this is where things become trickier. The identification of objective dimensions should not be confused with the scope of binding and preclusive effects. The binding and preclusive effects pertain only to these 200 euros. The factual findings and the legal qualifications only help us interpret which 200 euros. So, for instance, if we had uh, for instance, um, a, a, an accident, a vehicular accident, and the court found that the defendant is guilty because he ran through a red light, uh, and the claimant has therefore the claim for 200 euros. Uh, only, the, only this claim for 200 euros is precluded. However, if the claimant would then bring proceedings and uh, with the same uh, uh, circumstances. So again, he would claim something arising from that same vehicular accident. The court, which is now entertaining this second set of proceedings, could find that the defendant ran through a green light. So it's not bind, bound by the factual determinations of the first court. There are no binding effects as to the factual findings, legal qualifications and determinations on preliminary issues. Now, we also observe the French system, the French model, 
perhaps Stephanie will probably be more acquainted with this. It's the so-called triple identity test, where the same legal grounds and the same relief are, are relevant in order to identify the subject matter of the dispute vis-a-vis -vis the scope of res judicata. Uh, because Professor Yevitz has already talked about this in extent, I will not be repeating, going too much into detail. I would only like to emphasize the parts of the judgment which become res judicata um, under the French model. And things are murky, they're muddled, well, because uh, under the statutes, only the operative part should become res judicata. Uh, however, the motifs, the motives which encourage the court to issue uh, a certain kind of uh, operative part, do not become res judicata. An exception to this rule might be the case law of the Court de Cassation uh, regarding the motifs decisives, so reasons indispensable for understanding the operative part. Sometimes the, the Court de Cassation has uh, extended the res judicata also to the reasoning, therefore to these kinds of indispensable reasons. But uh, it's very hard to set uh, or to delimit which exactly uh, reasons uh, should be understand, understood as such. The situation is very similar in Bulgaria and quite similar in Spain, which also applies a sort of triple identity test. Uh, the Italian model seems to be quite broad relative to the French and German model, which at least uh, in principle pertain uh, restrict res judicata only to the operative part, because uh, under the Italian model, the um, closely connected or necessary decisions uh, found in the reasoning of the judgment also become res judicata. So it's not restricted only to the operative part. Res judicata is not restricted only to the operative part, but also pertains to the reasons of the judgment, which are necessary or closely connected to the operative part. Uh, basically, we see, if I try to visually interpret this, um, that European Union has two, roughly saying two models, so one very restrictive and one broad one. In the restrictive one, the operative part is the one which becomes res judicata and the reasoning only helps us understand the operative part. And under the broader one, the operative part becomes res judicata. However, res judicata also extends to the decisive reasons or clear preliminary issues. So factual findings, legal grounds, and so on become precluded or are or bind subsequent proceedings. Now in common law, you of course have issue preclusion and uh, uh, cause of action preclusion. Uh, however, in in our in the continental jurisdictions, at least from our observations from the project reports uh, and from previous research work done, um, these concepts are very much more relaxed, and we operate with very much descriptive concepts of what res judicata is. Now, uh, the theory of extension was somewhat ameliorated with the Gotha judgment by the CGU. In this famous judgment, German claimants filed an action against a German defendant in a Belgian court. The Belgian court dismissed the action on procedural grounds. It stated that it had no authority to hear the case because the German claimants were bound by a jurisdiction clause which provided for Icelandic courts to have exclusive jurisdiction. Failing to establish the uh, jurisdiction of the Belgian court, the Germans then went to a German court. And then the German court asked itself whether or not it should observe the prior decision of the Belgian court that the Icelandic courts have exclusive jurisdiction based on the prorogatio fori. The Court of Justice actually answered in the positive. It did not refer to the theory of extension effects where one should look uh, to the Belgian res judicata rules, whether they extend res judicata to, to preliminary decisions on jurisdiction, but it stated that the EU law is a sui generis system and that res judicata 
under EU law does not attach only to the operative part of the judgment in question, but also attaches to the ratio decidendi of that judgment, which provides the necessary underpinning for the operative part and is inseparable from it. This means that the European Court introduced a Euro autonomous concept of res judicata, at least in regards to interpreting res judicata for the purposes of uh, rules of jurisdiction. Uh, so, uh, what does this mean apart from this, that courts from other member states are obliged to respect the, oblig the, this, the decision of a court uh, from another member state regarding uh, a jurisdictional clause? Well, because the rationale of the Court of Justice was rooted in three reasons, that is mutual trust, the need for enforcing common rules of jurisdiction, which are found in the Brussels regulation, and the prohibition of reviewing jurisdiction of member state courts. This same res judicata extends also to other decisions made by courts in relation to international jurisdiction under the Brussels Convention. This means, for instance, if a dispute in member state A has been brought upon on the uh, grounds of Article 7.1b of the Brussels 1 regulation, which stipulates an elective jurisdiction uh, because the place of performance of a contract is found in that member state. And if member state A declines jurisdiction, stating that the place of performance is not in member state A, but in member state B, then the courts of member state B must respect that decision of, of the court of member state A as having res judicata and are bound to accept jurisdiction. This also means that all other member state courts should reject jurisdiction on the grounds of uh, performance of contract because member state A has already, this, uh, the court of the member state A has already determined that the place of, of, uh, of performance is in member state B. Uh, this should not go too far, however, because the place of performance may have relevancy not only to jurisdiction, but also to um, the merits of the case. Sometimes, uh, whether or not a contract has been uh, dutifully performed is dependent on where it has been performed. So, courts in member state B, to which the member state A has uh, referred to, should not be precluded from finding ultimately that no valid contract was actually concluded or that no tort was committed because tortious acts also have similar elective jurisdictions i.e forum delicti commissi. Um, these kinds of rules of res judicata of European uh, dimensions should not be uh, used for insurance, employment and consumer contracts because we already stated the rationale of the Court of Justice was not only enforcing common rules of jurisdiction, but also it was also based on the prohibition of reviewing jurisdiction of the member state of origin. And uh, this uh, prohibition uh, also has many exceptions, and these exceptions pertain exactly to insurance, employment and consumer contracts due to the principle of procedural fairness of uh, trying to protect the weaker party. Uh, further examination, um, this two-tier system of res judicata now means basically that, for instance, a Cypriot judge uh, who um, is handed a judgment from another member state will be bound by this concept developed by uh, the Court of Justice in the Gother case in regards to jurisdictional grounds. However, in all other regards as to the effects of res judicata, i.e. binding and preclusive effects on the merits of the case, uh, this Cypriot judge will be bound by the concept of res judicata as found in the member state of origin. Uh, now, this also brings us to paradoxical situations. For instance, in Slovenia, the scope of res judicata is restricted to the operative part of the judgment. But now, uh, due to the uh, judgment uh, of the Court of Justice of the European Union, when this judgment goes to Austria, it will have res judicata effect also in the reasoning, so, so as to say to the ratio decidendi. So the Slovenian judgment will have a greater scope of res judicata 
abroad than it does have in its home domestic member state. Well, uh, I hope I've somewhat shortened my time for three minutes. I hope I haven't been um, too boring to listen to, and it's. I hope that I made sense because the uh, the whole issue is very complex and uh, very hard to surmise um, in the set amount of time we have uh, for today. Um, yes, that brings me to conclude. Thank you once again. So thank you, Dennis, and right on time. So um, we will now um, yield the floor to Dr. Nicolas Kiriagidis for a presentation on the European Account Preservation Order and Enforcement of Judgments. So Nicola, you have um, half an hour. Uh, hi, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. And congrats for organizing this and for the program in general and for the wonderful uh, work, work you're doing at UCLAN. Um, so, um, my topic for today is uh, the European Account Preservation Order, the, the first uh, European-wide uh, provisional uh, measure, and how uh, that is related to, to, the, enfor to the enforcement of judgments um, uh, in, in the, within the EU. Uh, can I share, let me share my screen one second. So uh, first, a few words about the, the European Account Preservation Order, or the EAPO, as it is called. Uh, it, uh, it entered into force in uh, uh, January uh, 2017, uh, exactly five years ago, uh, as an additional uh, um, uh, legal instrument to domestic, uh, civil and commercial um, uh, legal instruments. Um, so, and this regulation allows creditors to freeze uh, the accounts of their debtors within the EU, excluding Denmark, pending litigation. Uh, its introduction was intended to uh, alleviate the problems of cross-border debt recovery within the, the, the EU single uh, market, uh, which is hampered by various procedural obstacles, especially in terms of enforcement. Um, in order not to be in conflict with the with the respective national enfor enforcement rules. The regulation um, refers to, to them in several points. For example, with regard to the enforcement of the, a the APO, uh, it is stated that this is uh, in accordance to national law. The regulation seems to be a useful tool for creditors whose debtors uh, have assets within the EU, but not in the country where the litigation is pending. And due to uh, lengthy enforcement proceedings, the latter were given the opportunity to dispose of them uh, to avoid satisfaction of a, of a judgment against them. Um, and um, th th this regulation is particularly important because it marked a significant shift towards a specific approach uh, instead of, of um, uh, a gen general harmonization efforts which were taking place before that. Uh, in the field of uh, EU-wide provisional measures. And this new approach uh, to specific measures promises to be more effective. Uh, so as I said before, the, the EAPO is the first interim, interim measure of EU-wide scope, uh, and it is also the first ex parte remedy uh, in European civil procedure. Uh, it is not, however, uh, an enforcement measure. It is only uh, a provisional measure that um, allows creditors to um, freeze the assets of uh, the counterparties pending um, the um, pending litigation. Um, my next few, my, my next um, uh, points will be to describe the background and the problems that uh, were there before the APO. Uh, then how we ended up. Um, with the current EAPO regulation, and then to um, tr describe the relationship between this regulation with uh, enforcement measures in the different member states, uh, as well as other EU-wide EU similar instruments, and finally propose um, that um, an expansion of the scope of, of the EAPO uh, that would include uh, enforcement of judgments as well as domestic disputes 
um, contrary to um, um, cross-border disputes, which is now its scope only, would um, better facilitate the, the, the enforcement of judgments around the EU. So first, um, the background and, and the problem that uh, that, uh, that that the APO tried to 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 to, to fix. Uh, I need to go to the next slide. One second. So um, it, it all started in 2009, uh, the, the discussion about the, the, the EAPO, which as I said, was it entered into force in 2017 uh, with the Stockholm program, uh, which stated that uh, the European judicial area should serve to support economic activity in the single market. Um, it invited the commission to put forward uh, proposals for improving the efficiency of enforcement of judgments in the EU uh, regarding bank accounts and uh, debt source assets in general. Then the EAPO ended up um, to include only the, the freezing of bank accounts and not assets in general. Um, and uh, according uh, uh, the commission action plan, um, implementing the Stockholm program referred to an initiative for a regulation on, on the freezing of bank accounts. Um, so, and, and the problems uh, during that period were that uh, a creditor seeking to recover their debt in another member state faced significant difficulties, uh, both in the context of uh, proceedings on the merit in which a court uh, issues a final judgment uh, on the basis um, uh, of, of a case, as well as proceedings for provisional measures in which a court issues an interim decision. Um, and in line with this political mandate, the APO focused on facilitating to obtain provisional measures for, preser for preserving a debtor's assets and on improving the efficiency of enforcement of decisions uh, in the European Union. Um, uh, as it was stated before, the, the implementation of the APO, um, um, uh, the problems of cross-border debt recovery uh, affected in the first place businesses which uh, are, were trading or providing services in other member states. And uh, the scale of uh, the cross-border bad debt uh, that um, uh, could pot potentially be secured after the implementation of the EAPO could be estimated around uh, 2 billion euros uh, on the basis of different sources of data. Uh, and um, according to the, the Eurobarometer uh, surveys back then, consumers were very reluctant to shop cross-border. 14% uh, of consumers shopping uh, at a distance encountered problems with the transaction, and over half of them considered that it, is difficult, that it was difficult to, to access civil justice in another EU member state. Um, so the general objectives of the of this initiative were to facilitate the recovery of cross-border uh, claims for citizens and, and businesses, and particularly uh, small medium enterprises, uh, and of course uh, increase confidence of traders, improve payment morale of debtors, reduce the risks involved in cross-border trade, and to improve the, to improve the efficiency of uh, enforcement of, of judgments. Um, now, the basis and the, and the current nature of the EAPO following the discussions. Um, uh, so, the, the idea of the proposed regulation was based on, on garnishment proceedings. Uh, in all member states, uh, garnishment is the most important form of monetary enforcement. The judgment creditor must present an enforceable instrument when applying for garnishment. At the first stage, the garnishee is informed about the attachment of the judgment debtor's bank account, and, the and, and then the, the enforcement organ prohibits any payment by the garnishee to the judgment debtor. In the second stage, the judgment creditor gets an enforceable title against the garnishee, and the structure of, the, the structure of, of these uh, proceedings, the garnishment proceedings, favors the, the enforcement 
of provisional measures, and particularly the freezing of assets, um, which uh, was actually fulfilled uh, by the, the, the EAPO. Uh, the Commission's pro proposal uh, distinguishes um, uh, distinguished uh, two different types of EAPO, and this was actually implemented uh, to the regulation. The first was um, uh, for the issue of an EAPO prior uh, uh, of um, uh, um, uh, acquiring a judgment. Uh, and then secondly, once a judgment uh, had been obtained, um, but uh, which had not been yet declared enforceable in, in another member state. Um, at the time of the Commission's green papers, there was uh, uncertainty about whether any attachment freezing procedure would be provisional in nature only, or could be extended to allow a mechanism for, for garnishment, for uh, actually en enforcement. Um, the, the, proposal, the proposal, however, was finally restricted to provisional measures only, and, uh, and therefore, as I said before, the EAPO is not an, an enforcement measure. It's only it is only a provisional measure. Now, the the, the relationship um, uh, between uh, uh, enforcement measures in the different member states uh, and the EAPO and uh, other EU-wide instruments. Um, as already discussed, uh, the, the as I just said, the EAPO is not an enforcement measure. And um, the, the EAPO itself, it is even enforced according to, to domestic enforcement rules. Um, the different member states face significant problems of uh, enforcement of judgments. Um, there are various data uh, looking at the EU Justice Scoreboard. Uh, however, um, it, it says that uh, there is no co uh, comparable data in most member states. But uh, judging from uh, Cyprus, uh, enforcement of judgments is uh, particularly problematic. Uh, there are also a number of other procedural instruments related to EU-wide enforcement. Uh, first is uh, the European Enforcement Order. Um, which um, allows judgment judgments made in one member state to be enforced in another. Uh, there are restrictions on the type of judgments they apply to, to, to this order. For example, they can be used in uncontested uh, civil and, and commercial uh, cases only. Uh, secondly, the European Payment Order, um, which um, was introduced uh, 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 about 15 years ago, and it applies between all member states except Denmark, and the procedure allows creditors to, to recover uncontested civil and commercial claims using a simplified procedure. And finally, the small claims procedure, uh, which uh, covers claims up to 5,000 euros uh, in any EU country except uh, for Denmark. Um, and, and the European small claims procedure is an alternative to national procedures a judgment for this uh, procedure is, is recognized and enforceable in another EU country and cannot be uh, cannot be op opposed. Um, as I said, there are problems with the, with enforcement within member states when uh, the enforcement of a judgment from a, from another member state does not fall within the above. Uh, and going now to my last and I guess longer section uh, is the question whether we should consider an EU-wide garnishment order. So as we have the European Account Preservation Order, which is a pro provisional measure um, of uh, EU-wide uh, effect only for cross-border disputes, available only for cross-border disputes, should its uh, scope be expanded to uh, to, to also being a, an enforcement remedy and, and also to, to apply to, to domestic disputes as well as cross-border. Um, let me move to my final slide. So um, the APO is not an enforcement measure. Uh, it does not govern 
the, the conversion of, of the protective measure into a measure transferring the ownership of the funds to the creditor for the purpose of satisfying the claim. Uh, this is entirely left to national law. In other proposals, such as the one for the European payment order or the small claims regulation, uh, the Commission had tried to expand the, the scope of application of, of the new instruments beyond cross-border cases. Um, for example, the, the, in the initial proposal for the for the small claims regulation, the, the Commission had put forward that the new EU procedure would apply to both cross-border and domestic situations in order to avoid distortions of competition within the internal market. Um, and according to the Commission, to effectively address disparities in the access to small claims among the member states, a common EU small claims procedure would have to be accessible to claimants irrespective of the cross-border nature of the case so including uh, purely internal uh, cases. Uh, the European Parliament rejected this view uh, and, the, and the small claims regulation only ap applies in cross-border cases. Um, and uh, before, the, before the Lisbon Treaty, the debate between the Commission on the one side and the Council and the Council and Parliament on the other side about defining cross-border cases in EU instrument uh, was actually about the scope of the cooperation in uh, civil and commercial matters and how it would affect the functioning of the internal market. Uh, this debate revolted around the interpretation of uh, the then Article 65, uh, uh, the legal basis the EU acted upon when adopting uniform EU procedures and other instruments of, 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 private, of private international law. Uh, Article 65 conferred competence to, to the EU to adopt measures of judicial cooperation in civil and commercial matters, uh, but limited it in two ways. On the one hand, it required the measure to address matters having cross-border implications, and on the other, it limited EU action insofar as necessary for the proper functioning of the internal market. Uh, the Commission had always seen uh, the, the reference to the internal market as, as a restriction of the cross-border limitation, uh, but it had many times proposed a broad reading of the two in order to give the EU measures the larger possible scope of application. Um, the successor of Article 65 and the legal base of uh, the, the EAPO regulation, which is the Article 81 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, removed the internal market limitation. So Article 81 in its current version was introduced by the um, uh, Lisbon Treaty uh, following the relevant uh, provision of, of the Constitutional Treaty and describes EU action particularly when necessary for the proper functioning of the internal market. So this alteration made the reference uh, to the internal market optional, uh, thus uh, enlarging the scope of the competence of the EU in the field of cooperation in civil and commercial matters. Uh, in its current version, Article 81 still requires that the matters addressed by the EU measure uh, have cross-border implications, but such implications may be related to something else than the proper functioning of the internal market. Um, arguably, this modification does not uh, substantially impact the core of the debate about whether EU procedures can, can cover non-cross-border cases. Uh, indeed, the removal of the internal market requirement can be explained by the addition of um, uh, Article 81, Paragraph 3, uh, a special legal basis for cross-border measures dealing with family matters. Uh, it does not give any indication as to whether the broad reading of the Commission was correct or had become the new approach of, of the treaty makers. Uh, nonetheless, the Commission proposal for the EAPO regulation had renounced to put forward uh, the, uh, this idea uh, expressed in the proposal for the small claims regulation, that civil procedure itself had pro cross-border implications and a level playing field regarding access to justice uh, in, in civil and commercial matters would contribute to a more efficient internal market integration. Uh, the court debate regarding the scope of the cross-border limitation in the legal uh, base is echoed uh, in the travaux uh, prevaladoire 
of the EAP regulation, with the Commission proposal having wished for a broader definition of the cross-border cases covered by the EAP regulation, rejected by the European Parliament and Council. Um, the long-lasting nature of this debate proves that its roots are political. Uh, and like may, many of the issues regarding um, a legal uh, based um, legal basis in the field of shared competence, it is linked to the struggle of power between the member states and the EU. Uh, at the origin of this tension, there is what has been called the competence problem, which is the concern that the principle of, of sub, uh, subsidiarity uh, as protected by the treaties was insufficient to safeguard uh, the, pro the prerogatives of the member states and contain EU action. Um, at least in the, field of, in the field of cooperation in civil uh, procedure, in particular for EU procedures like the EAPO, the, the will of the legislator has been to reduce the grip of EU law. Uh, the reasons for that may be that the, the realm uh, of civil procedure remains hi highly politicized uh, for member states and close uh, to their specific legal traditions. Also, uh, at the roots of the problem is the question of whether the new EU uniform procedures, uh, alternatives to national ones, such as the EAPO, fulfill the aim of the policy area as explained uh, and as expressed by the by the legal basis um, of Article 81, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty uh, of the Functioning of the EU, and especially letters E and F, um, which describe um, effective ac access to justice, um, which refer to effective access to justice and the proper functioning of, of civil proceedings. So, so the question, uh, and to conclude with this, uh, the question is, um, is enforcement of judgments within the, the member states and also across EU member states uh, up to standards, up to the standards that, that the EU um, wills for all of its member states? If it is not, then uh, it is argued that action is required for a, a uniform, effective uh, EU instrument, such as an EU-wide garnishment order, so an EU-wide enforcement order, which will apply for both domestic matters uh, as well as uh, cross-border disputes. This remains to be seen uh, in the coming years. Um, I should say that the EAPO has a review clause uh, after five years of its um, uh, enactment, which is uh, basically uh, now. So um, its scope could be extended uh, further to, to also include um, enforcement of proceedings and perhaps um, uh, to apply in, in, in uh, um, domestic proceedings and not only in cross-border cases. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and for, for, for keeping on time. Um, this leaves us with, with about 15 minutes for um, a round table discussion, which I will be moderating with, with my colleague, um, Dimitra Loizu. Um, so, I would like to, to um, open the floor um, to questions to our, our speakers, and then this will get the discussion going. So, um, uh, Denis Bakrizabehi and Professor Vesna Rujevek, uh, alongside Dr. Nicolas Kiriagidis. So, any questions? I mean, Phil, if you could just raise your hand and we will we'll try and moderate like that. or pop your question in the chat. Okay, so, I mean, I, I, I can, can start with, with a question, perhaps. Um, so, for us, the experience of, of participating in, in such an interesting project um, is, is really unique. Um, we bring the, the common law experience um, and have realized the, the differences that uh, are observed. Um, I remember the very first thing that we noted was the understanding of a judgment or um, an enforcement title. So we had this discussion, uh, which was probably the first task uh, we had to look into. Um, so I wanted to, to ask either uh, Dennis or, or Professor Erjavec in, in relation to the um, 
this whether really we have a varying understanding across member states and how that impacts on cross-border enforcement and how that could be remedied. And I know Nicolas brought an idea about uniformity uh, generally. Um, well, um, I will have to excuse Professor Yeves. Uh, she seems to be absent, but I've um, messaged her. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, the experience is shared. Uh, I remember also when we discussed uh, res judicata and you mainly referred to finality and uh, whether or not it is at all appropriate that we speak about res judicata and so on. Now, of course, um, what is a judgment um, should be looked at euro autonomously. So through the case law of the Court of Justice, which also tries to derive its own interpretation from the laws of the member states. And it's also interesting to see which laws predominant are predominant in its interpretation. The Court of Justice seems to be in many areas reliant on the French uh, system, which is not that much of a surprise due to French concepts being um, the predominant ones in international law. Um, now, how uh, you would uh, remedy this uh, variety? I think it would be um, very hard. Uh, now, the European Law Institute and UNIDRA are, have drafted uh, a uh, model set of rules of European civil procedure. I think it was fairly recently, last year or something like that, where they uh, proposed a framework for the structure, contents and effects of judgments. So this could be one way, one approach uh, to go into the you know, aim of unifying or at least harmonizing European civil procedure. Now, one way is, of course, by introducing um, autonomous uh, procedures like uh, uh, was already established by the previous speaker. So, for instance, the European payment order and so on. So when you have a basically parallel system to the national ones, um, but the other one, the remaining one, that is the one we are relying on now, is basically just through trial and error. So um, seeing what the Court of Justice accepts as a judgment or doesn't. And I hope that our project will be able to contribute somewhat by elaborating on which decisions a member state can issue and what kind of defects, effects they have. Uh, and which of these decisions thereafter could, according at least to our to us, the national reporters, could be considered um, judgments within the EU, within the Brussels at least, um, meaning. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing I think that may be of interest to, to legal professionals is the, the oracle that you, um, you mentioned, which I think at the hands, um, when it is operative and the idea is that at the hands of legal professionals will be an extremely helpful tool in in ascertaining what it is that they have in that they're dealing with um, that comes from 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 another um, uh, EU member state. So um, uh, we can I'll, I'll pop the um, the website our our project. Um, link as well in the chat for everyone to to have and perhaps follow. Uh, as Dennis explained, the project is about to uh, complete. Uh, we're we're expecting for it to be completed end of next month. Dennis. Yeah. Yes, by the yeah. end of March. Yeah. So, but generally, the website will will be populated. There's there's a lot of uh, output um, as was as was already mentioned. But it's um, and I don't know if anyone has um, any question before I, I pose a question to, to Nicolas? I mean, I'm trying to see if, if there's uh, someone raising their hand. If you are and I can't see you, then feel free to unmute yourself. But from what I can see, perhaps Dimitra, I don't see any raised hands. But Dimitra has her hand up. 
I could come after you, Nevi, because I also have a question for Nicolas, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, okay, so then I'll, I'll, I'll let you pose the question to Nicolas first. And uh, Nicolas, I mean, we, are, I mean, you didn't really directly discuss this, but to what extent are the new civil procedure rules in Cyprus going to make uh, the judges and the lawyers' uh, lives easier in terms of uh, cross-border enforcement of judgments? Uh, not much, or maybe not at all, <laughs> because they uh, do not touch upon uh, enforcement measures at all. Uh, so, uh, I mean, they, they actually categorize. Uh, and they um, gather together uh, some enforcement provisions from, uh, you know, different uh, in, uh, um, laws, and they put them within the uh, new CPR. Uh, but um, actually, what is now being discussed as a next step is uh, the, the reform of uh, the, the enforcement uh, legal uh, framework in Cyprus, which is um, admittedly very, very problematic. Uh, and, and what I'm proposing is because, you know, we're, we're very late to implement the reforms in Cyprus and, and in many member states. Um, and we don't, we don't, uh, I mean, the quality of uh, legislation is, uh, is, is not good. The, the speed and the um, uh, timing when they are actually enforced and implemented is, is also uh, not good. It's, they're usually delayed um, for, for a long time. So if this leg legislation uh, comes from the EU, um, then we're discussing about, you know, better quality enforcement measures um, and, um, you know, easier for citizens, companies, lawyers to understand enforcement systems around the EU because uh, it's not just Cyprus who has uh, these problems. I think a lot, many member states have, um, you know, their enforcement measures are uh, are not adequate. And um, what I'm proposing is actually twofold. First, expansion of this provisional measure, which is the EAPO, to include enforcement measures. And then, um, you know, these instruments to also include domestic disputes and not just cross-border disputes. Uh, and it could work, I mean, the first part could, could be come first because, um, um, you know, I think countries are very reluctant to, to, to accept um, uh, changes in their civil procedure rules uh, imposed by the EU. Uh, but eventually, I, I don't see any, you know, downside. Uh, I, if the majority of the member states were, uh, you know, um, their enforcement framework was functioning well, then I, of course I wouldn't propose this. But since we have so many problems, not just in, in Cyprus, I also know uh, about Greece, um, uh, about Italy uh, and other countries which are facing similar problems. So. Uh, if a piece of legislation legislation comes from you know the technocrats of the EU, I think this would solve a lot of problems uh, in our in our lives. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nelly. Yeah, no, and I think it touches on the um, on the on the issues and how to go about um, practically solving. These problems, I mean, Dennis mentioned the model of civil procedure. And if one was to look at um, the, the model law in relation to arbitration, that has worked very well in that it has provided um, what is now, I think, more or less the norm. Countries have either uh, taken that verbatim or they have taken inspiration from it. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's having international institutions, but also the EU, um, try and provide um, either, you know, because it's here the harmonization, but also the, the notion of uniformity, which which is, is I think it's at, it's at, um, um, at rivalry here. But I, I, I do also think that the, the, the way forward, and I do agree with, with, with Nicolas in relation to what we need, um, to, in order to be effective and in order to allow the other um, issue that I have um, identified is legal professionals 
feeling certain in relation to the advice they can give and the support they can give their clients. Because at the moment, you have the legal professional, the lawyer that will have to um, address the issue, that will try and provide assistance and legal advice. But yet, where do they start? How can they start? So I think um, we do need technocrats and we do need research projects like the ones that the EU Commission is funding, the ones that um, the one that we're about to conclude. But I know, Nicolas, um, that UNIC was also involved in a, in a similar project. And this is the way forward to, to try and um, enlighten the way on what needs to be done to assure um, lawyers, but also parties, can uh, enforce um, uh, judgment. And again, making a distinction, I, I mean, I um, once a practicing lawyer, but now an academic that looks at ADR, so dispute resolution. Um, again, the New York Convention, um, you know, the success of that. So trying to emulate that and hopefully, hopefully through um, uh, individual, individual uh, steps, initiatives, uh, but also research projects, then uh, the situation will, will become uh, better and lawyers but also parties will be able to feel that they are uh, advising correctly and that they are um, enforcing um, their legal rights. I don't know if, if this has triggered questions or if anyone wants to add anything. Uh, if I would like to, uh, if I could add to what you said, Nevi, I, I fully agree on what you said and um, I mean, it, experience showed that um, we cannot harmonize everything at once and this is why uh, th this um, uh, regulation the eap regulation is interesting because you know the previous discussions were you know to harmonize everything harmonize all uh, uh, provisional protective measures around the eu or har harmonize the, the whole of uh, uh, you know large parts of civil procedure rules um, although i mean um, um, works such as model rules show that we can, um, um, you know, agree on certain principles. But I think the, the the way forward is harmonize small parts. So this is what the EAPO did. It uh, harmonized one thing, uh, freezing orders. So it it created an EU-wide freezing order, and only for freezing of bank accounts. So it didn't include other assets, for example. So it started small. And um, I think this will work better. And eventually people will, um, I mean, the users of the system, lawyers, uh, judges will um, feel comfortable with it. And then it will be easier to expand it. And uh, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, an enforcement, an EU wide enforcement measure to, to include everything. We could start small again with, you know, a certain enforcement measure to apply EU-wide. And then um, we improve and we proceed. This is what I'm suggesting. Yes, You're so my, yeah. My mute button is temperamental today, but I think the past two years, the word, the, the phrase "you are on mute" <laughs> is what we all hear. Um, so I see, I see the time that is already um, eight o'clock. And unless there are any other questions, then I would like to to wrap this um, webinar up. Um, thank you to our, our our speakers today, but also for those that uh, participated. Um, I hope this this webinar has provided you food for thought, so has provided you knowledge, but also food for thought. Um, and as I said, I will pop the the project um, link um, in the chat for for future reference if you wish. Um, you have the contact details of the speakers, so if this has sparked any interest or you would like further information, then I'm sure that they will have no problem in in, in you reaching out. Um, so, um, you're, you're, you're free to go. Have a, have a, uh, lovely, lovely, um, evening. So Martina is asking for the feedback form. I think that will be, that will be, um, 
sent to you. We we have Cosandinos and Nicolas, so you will hear from us if there is um, a follow up. Um, so that's about it. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 bye.